I was thinking earlier, um, before I got up here to uh, get into our message, that I talked to you just a little bit. Um, you know, I, I wonder sometimes, especially if you weren't raised in the church or if you were raised, uh, you know, around the church or you had any experience in the church, you know what people think about certain things in our service and, um, you know, everything from worship. You know, one of the things we were talking about earlier in worship is, man, we really want to create uh, an atmosphere of freedom to where you are able to connect with God in a very real and personal way, uh, corporately together as the body of Christ. And if that means, you know, sitting, standing, kneeling, shouting, being silent, you know, whatever it is, we really want you to have that freedom, you know, and in every part of our service, the, uh, I hope, and, and at least one of the things we try really hard, at least I really try really hard, I know what my wife does, is to be very genuine in that, you know, and we want you to know that, hey, there's no show up here, right? You know, when I get up here to do a message, sometimes, you know, I'll have people come up to me afterwards and say, hey, that's a real, that, that, that was a great rehearsed sermon, you know, or, or whatever the case is. And, and really, that's not the case. I mean, you know, every week we just spend time praying, you know, searching the scriptures, figuring out what it is that we feel like God wants us to say, and we just try to communicate it. So if it comes off, you know, any other kind of way or show, then I feel like we failed dr dramatically, you know. And, uh, and, and, and what it's all about, I mean, just to say it very shortly, very plainly, and it's probably as best as I can even say it is, it's all about making disciples, you know, Jesus called us to make disciples, and we want to do that. We want to be that as the body of Christ and as a church. And I was thinking about that as we were singing earlier, and then uh, my son was a part of the, the uh, communion and the offering group, you know, going around and, you know, handing out the trays and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, I'm so thankful for bodies of Christ and churches so I can see my son be made a disciple. I was thinking about today, Keith, getting a chance to baptize another one of his girls in Abbey. And we get a chance to celebrate that a little bit later at the beach. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, all right? And so please don't misunderstand that this is some type of uh, rehearsed thing or some show we're trying to build or some concert we're trying to do. That's not it at all, all right? So I just wanted to say that, hey, it has nothing to do with the message today. So I'm off that soapbox here, and I promise I won't get back on it. Um, Today, I'm excited that you're here because today we're wrapping up our message series that we've been doing called uh, Deep Sixed. And, uh, you know, the idea behind that, that, you know, where it came from, in case you've not been here or you're picking up on our last day, ironically, of our series, you can if you want to get caught up on all of our sermons online through our website or our YouTube page, and uh, you can do that. But... Uh, Back in the days prior to technology of sonar and things like that, deep six was this term, this phrase that would be used to indicate that there's a, a fathom of six fathoms, you know, deep or 36 feet underneath the surface of the water. And it was a phrase that was oftentimes used when something was meant to be pretty much gone forever. It had sunk to a a depth that was irretrievable. You might as well forget about it. It's been, you know, buried in a watery grave. Whatever it was, whatever it is that you once held dear to yourself, you might as well just forget about it. It's been deep six. That's where it comes from. And the truth is where the series is, you know, developed and, and how we tried to communicate that to you is, you know, Truth be told, in all of our lives, if you think about your life as I think about my life, you know, we have things in our life, we have moments in our life, we have memories in our life, we have mistakes in our life that we would like to deep six, right? We'd like to just toss them out there, forget about them, hope that it never gets brought up, hope that nobody ever finds out, right? We'd like to put them in a watery grave somehow, if we could. Everything from distant, embarrassing memories, some things that aren't too serious in our life, to other things that are way more painful, way more traumatic, way more difficult for us to deal with. We all have them. 
It doesn't matter who you are this morning, and, and even if you're young enough that where you can't really think of a whole lot, chances are you're going to have probably plenty of them in your life. And so for many of us, when it comes to these various areas of life, whether it's sin, whether it's secrets, whether it's shame, whatever it is, it can make us very nervous. It can make our palms, in fact, get very sweaty when we think about these things. And we may even say, you may be saying to yourself right now, I'm not so sure that I really want to talk about these things. I don't really want to bring them to the surface. And I don't, I mean, are you really asking, Will, that we air out all of our dirty laundry? And what we've been saying from the very beginning is, no, that's not the case at all. We don't want that. We're not trying. Our goal isn't for you to relive any of your bad past experiences or memories or traumatic things in your life. It's not about heaping more guilt or more shame on you in any kind of way. It's not about condemning you for things that you have done uh, in your life. Our goal, what this series is all about, is simply to suggest that there's a better way than us trying to deep six our past mistakes or areas that we're not too proud of. And there's a better way, and it really begins with our focus on our relationship with God. I call it the vertical relationship. As you think about your relationship with God, uh, you know, and beginning in that kind of way. It's kind of like, you know, if you got a shirt like I got, you know, the buttons on a shirt. You know, you think about that as you think about your vertical relationship with God. You know, how many of you, let me ask you, how many of you have gotten ready real early in the morning and it was still dark, right? You've done that before, many of you have. If you've been anything like me, you know, you get ready in the dark, you walk outside, you go to work, you do whatever you got to do, and then it may be a while for you to even look at yourself in the mirror, when you see yourself in the mirror, you got a, a shirt like this, what happens sometimes? Your buttons are all out of alignment, right? You skipped a button somewhere, you know? And so, you know, the, the idea is, is that we have to get the first button right in order for all the other bu buttons to match up properly. And the same thing is true of our relationship with God, especially in regards to what it is we're talking about. It begins with him. It starts with him. And we're trying, you know, so oftentimes in life, to hide things away from God as if that's even possible. I mean, he sees all, right? We know that about God. It's part of his character. He knows all, but we still try to hide things all the time. Even though it doesn't make a lot of sense, we still do it. And besides what God really wants, and we've already talked about this, what he really wants is to give us his love, his mercy, and his grace. But sometimes, and again, and I'm going to put myself out there, sometimes it's hard for us to receive those things, his love and grace and mercy. Why? Because we don't think we deserve it. We don't think we're worthy of it. But you know, I think that's one of the things that's so beautiful about grace. You think about it for yourself. Grace is not, is not only being pardoned for something. It's about aligning ourselves with our relationship with God. Just like we talked about through Jesus, right? It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us. And if necessary, to even help us work other things out, not in the vertical part of the relationship, but even horizontally when we think about all of our relationships with other people in our lives. You know, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. I'm gonna give you a bunch of verses this morning, but, and I'm gonna go very fast through these. So uh, I want you to just kind of hang on to them. If you need to take a picture of it with your phone or something like that, if you don't have time to write it down. But Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. Now that's a pretty straightforward verse, right? I like straightforward verses because there's no guessing to it. It is pretty straightforward. Whoever conceals their sins does not pro prosper. The idea of we truly want peace and joy Joy and freedom in our life, then the, the, what the Bible verse is telling us is we can't conceal things. Instead, it says this, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Now, remember, remember, what we're talking about here is the vertical relationship we have with God, right? And, 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 and the idea, of what we're talking about, this idea of confession, repentance, what that happens in that relationship, then God, what he does, he can start working through some of the other relationships in our life and maybe those same kinds of things need to happen. I'm not gonna tell you that this morning. I'm not gonna tell you that you're not gonna need to go and confess something to someone else because God may lay that on your heart. But it starts with him and then it works its way out. And one thing that I do know is that the cost of concealment is always greater and it's even more cumulative, but it's always, the cost of concealment is always greater than the cost of confession. 
David writes it like this, and David knew a lot about the idea of concealing things. Psalm chapter 51, verses three and four, he says, and maybe you can relate to this, I know I can. He says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. In other words, he's kind of like, look, you know, it's like looking at myself in the mirror. I see it, I know that it's there. And then he goes on to say, against you, talking to God, against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. What's this, a, what's this a, an image or a picture of? It, it's an image or a picture of conviction. It's standing before God knowing that he truly sees us, right? Knowing that, that you know, again, that God is all-knowing and, and that he truly sees everything. And so the truth is conviction, when we talk about conviction in our life, we kind of talked about this a few weeks ago, it can be really healthy as long as you do something with it. Right, As long as you're giving it over to God, conviction can be helpful in that way. However, if you carry conviction, and especially if you carry it for a very long time, what, is it, what does it do to us? It eats at us, right? And some of you know what that's like. It, you've been, it's been eating at you for a while. Eventually, what happens is when you don't do anything with conviction, it just turns into this really heavy burden that we wind up carrying around sometimes for years upon years in our lives. And let me just tell you, this isn't just something that non-Christians do. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians do this. Like I said last week, I think at the root of that is this misunderstanding of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So part of this series has also been about trying to remind us of what God wants to do with our burdens. Just like the scripture in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 24 through 25, God says it like this. He says, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, this is God speaking, I, even I, am he who blots out transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins, he says, no more. God's speaking to us like this. He's, he's essentially saying, you know, I, I know, I get it. You, you, the sins in your life, you may not be able to forget. The people in your life may not be able to forget. The people that you've hurt or the people that have hurt you, you may not be able to forget, but I'm God. God is reminding us, I am infinite. My power is, 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 is infinite. I am sovereign. I can choose to forget if I want to. You think about that statement for a second. God and his sovereignty, this is so huge. I hope you can kind of wrap your mind around this, that, that, that when it comes to God's forgiveness and his grace in our lives, the big idea is that God not only can, but wants to forgive our sins. He wants to blot them out. He not only wants to take them from you, he wants to send them to a watery grave. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you up front, here's what I wanna do today, okay? As we wrap this series up, we're, and since today is Baptism Sunday, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to show you how baptism ties into this beautiful picture of being deep six. But that, that's what he says. He says, I, I, wanna, I wanna send them to a watery grave to be forgotten. If you were here last week, we read this verse together. Psalm 103, verse 12, it says this. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has my sins, or so far has he removed our transgressions and our sins from us. And I don't know about you, but I love that picture, right? I told you last week, it's kind of like a compass. You look at the, you look at the east, you look at the west. And, and the idea is, the concept of God's forgiveness and grace is, what's the farthest distance between two points? What's well, kind of like east and west. One going one way, the other going the other. And that's God's forgiveness and his grace in our lives. Why continue to hang on to sin 
Why, why do we continue to try and conceal it? it it's, like, it's like, you know, I, I brought, you know, I told you about this last week. I brought, I brought it on the stage this morning. I borrowed it from actually Mary Lee uh, out in the gym. But it's like a beach ball that you try to hold underneath the water, right? Have you ever done that before? You've been in a pool or out in the ocean and you try to hold this underneath the water. It takes pretty much all that you have, right? All your attention, all of your effort, both hands, both arms to hold this underneath the water. And in fact, anytime you let go of it, what's going to happen? It's gonna resurface. It's gonna come up eventually. And, and that, that's kind of how, you know, the, what we do with the sin in our life. We try to hold it down. We hope that nobody ever finds out. We, we try to conceal it. We try to cover it up. And, and so often, again, you know, one of the things that, you know, again, God wants to give us what? He wants to give us grace. He wants to give us mercy. He wants to give us forgiveness. And what happens is our hands are tied. We don't have room to grab a hold of it. They're busy. We're afraid if we let go, then people are going to know. People are going to find out. Our sin is going to come to the surface. I think we spend so much time, effort, and energy just trying to manage our image. We spend so much time, effort, and energy trying to make everything look good on the outside, trying to manage our sins, our secrets, our shame, Try to keep the beach ball hidden. All the while, God is pleading with us. Again, if you don't hear anything this morning, I hope you hear this. God is pleading with us. He's pleading with you. If you're here this morning and, and that's a, a, a beautiful description of you trying to conceal, trying to hold, trying to cover up, he's pleading with you. Would you please just let go of it? God's like, listen, if you, I'm here. The, the reason I came is for you to give me those things and, and, and not just your burden. I mean, I want to deep six those things. In fact, I believe God wants us to come to him empty handed because then we can receive his grace and his mercy much easier. You know, I, I've realized this, you know, as being a father of both of my boys, they, they do wrong things at times, you know. Again, I'm not gonna point out any wrong things, Brody, but you do wrong things from times, <laughs> and you know what those things are. But you know what, in all seriousness, it tears me up inside, especially when they do something wrong and they don't know that I know they've done something wrong. And I see them carrying around all that guilt and shame. It tears me up to think that sometimes they don't feel like they can come to me and give it to me and, and trust me with it, know that I will love them no matter what. And I tell them that all the time, they know that, but there are times where that just doesn't seem real. And there are times where I am in those kinds of situations and I, and I really just want to grab up my kids. Maybe you've been there before. I just, I just want to grab them up and say, hey, listen, it's not necessary. It, it's really okay. I, I know what you're trying to do. I know what you're trying to hide from me. I know what you're carrying around. And, and what I want you to know is that it's, it's okay. You can trust me. You can give it. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm willing to help you carry it. And the truth is, you know, as I was thinking about that this week, how much more, you know, as a father, how much more as God the Father looks at us and sees us trying to do those very same things. And he's just like, hey, I'm here for you. That's why I came. I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30, he says like this. Again, I'm just gonna read this. You can listen. I mean, many of you have heard these verses before. Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus didn't, didn't mean that by coming to him that, you know what, ne no bad things are going to happen in your life, right? You're never going to get sick, right? You're always going to have enough money. You know, they're, they're, you're always, you're always going to have people around you who agree with you and, and who are on your team. I mean, you know, you're never going to have bad breath if you just follow me. Jesus didn't mean any of those things, right? 
That's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, listen, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about sin. He's talking about shame. He's talking about our secrets. He wants to take those burdens from us. Remember Jesus' words in John chapter 16. He said it like this. He said, in this world, you will continue to have trouble even when you give me your life. In this world, you're gonna have trouble, but take heart. What does he say? Anybody? I have overcome the world. Jesus is reminding us, right? You know, hey, you're in you know, this war. I, I've won this war. You may still have battles in your life, but I've overcome the war. Just give it, give me, come to me. Give me the things that you're trying so desperately to hide. I will lighten your burden, all the sin, all the shame, all the secrets. You, you don't have to try to manage those things. You don't have to try to deep six them. Let me do that. That's God's message to us. He, he'll take care of it. He'll put them in a watery grave. And I told you one of the things I wanted to do is make the connection with baptism because that really brings this beautiful picture of baptism really into focus and what it means in, in faith and obedience to follow Jesus with your life. You remember reading uh, last week, we read Romans chapter six, verses one and two. You know, we talked about what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, Paul says, we are those who had died to sin. How can we live in it any longer, right? Now, you pick up in verse three, he says it like this. He says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You see, the watery grave that we're talking about this morning, that's what this, that's what this image is. That's what this picture of, of baptism is, the idea of going underneath the water, right? The symbolism of the old life before grace, before mercy, before forgiveness. And then in verse four, he says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So the image here, I mean, it's sort of paradoxical if you think about it. One of death and one of life. One of a watery grave and one of the resurrection. And I want you to hold on to that thought here, okay? Because I want to give you one more example here as we kind of wrap things up this morning. In Acts chapter 16, I want, to, I want to focus on a story here in the book of Acts. If you've got your Bibles, you can look there. Acts chapter 16, we're going to jump into verse 25. But just kind of give you a little bit of context of what we're going to jump into here. These, these two guys, the apostle Paul and Silas. And they find themselves in a jail cell in the town of Philippi. And they had been thrown in jail because of doing ministry, right? They were preaching and teaching about Jesus. And, and for some of you think, well, man, that doesn't sound too bad, but here's what you need to know. In the town of Philippi, that was against Roman customs. And so they had healed a, 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 a person who was demon possessed. They'd already done that. And they'd already thrown the town into a kind of a, 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 you know, a, a spin. And so they were brought before the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Roman uh, officials, and they were literally beaten and flogged severely, the Bible says. And now they're sitting in a jail cell. And so you pick up in verse 25. This is what it says. This is such a cool story. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What time was it? Midnight. About midnight, the Bible says. What were they doing? They were singing, they were praying. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, you know, I just told you kind of the fourth story before this. You know, here's these guys, they, they've been arrested, they've been beaten. The Bible says they were flogged severely. And now they're sitting in a jail cell, jail cell shackled at their ankles. And they're, they're singing praise songs. What's your favorite praise song? Think about that. And then imagine putting yourself in this situation with one of your good friends, 
all bloodied and beaten and bruised and tired. And imagine around midnight, singing with your friends, praising God. And all, the Bible says all the prisoners were listening. I mean, you better believe it, right? What other choice are they gonna have at midnight? They're, they're all listening to them. I bet they were. I can imagine the other prisoners probably aren't too happy about it, right? They're probably, they're probably not too happy about Paul and Silas, especially if they sing like me. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking man, if it's me, you know, I kind of sound like a dying calf in a hell storm, you know? And so I'm here singing, you know, I love you, Lord, you know? And, and then everybody's having to listen to that. What a tremendous witness these guys had. Because everybody's listening. That's what it says in verse 26. It says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains, it says, came loose. And it says in verse 20, 27 there, you look, it says the jailer woke up. So here's this guy, right? And he's supposed to be taking care of the prisoners, supposed to be watching the prisoners, making sure nobody escapes. And what's happened? He's falling asleep on the job, right? He's falling asleep on the job. And so, you know, he, all the things going on, the, the violent earthquake, dude wakes up and he saw that the prison doors were open. And so what's he do? He draws his sword. He's about to kill himself. That's what the Bible's describing here. He's about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And so this guy, I mean, I can imagine he's pretty startled. He wakes up and he sees all the commotion. He realized what's happened. And, and I'm not sure what he's thinking. He may have been thinking, I'm gonna get fired now. And that may have been so devastating to him that he was gonna take the action he's gonna take. Maybe he thought, you know, he was worried about his reputation and, and he knew that he would never be able to live in a town again knowing what he had done or, or whatever the case is. And, and, and may, maybe he thought that because of what happened, he was, you know, the Romans are gonna kill him anyway. Whatever the case is, the Bible says he pulls out his sword, he's about to take his own life. And then verse 28, Paul shouted, he shouts, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now I would imagine at that moment, the other prisoners that are there with them are kind of like, dude, why are you saying anything right now? We're about to get out of here, right? We're, we're about to escape. What, let him fall on his sword, right? That's a get out of jail pass. But here's the thing, and I want to point this out because I think it's, it, it, to me, it's not trivial. I think this is another sign here of a burden-free life in Paul. In other words, he's kind of like, listen, you can shackle me all day long, but truly, my shackles are off because of Jesus. I got peace, I got freedom in my life because of Jesus. And I think the jailer began to notice that because look at verse 29. It says the jailer called for the lights. He still hadn't seen with his own eyes what's going down, right? He's just startled and in a panic. And then it says he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And in verse 30 it says, and this is so amazing. Verse 30, it says, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what a great question, right? And what a great question. I mean, I hope and pray it's a question that we all ask at one point in our life. What do I got to do to be saved? What, what, what is it, God, that you're asking of me? Jesus, what do I got to do to follow you? What do I got to do to become a disciple? And what's even more amazing to me is this man, he really wasn't concerned at the point of, of saving his job. He wasn't that concerned about saving his reputation. He wasn't really that concerned about saving his own life. What he was most concerned about was saving his soul. And what we find out is even the souls of his family. That's what he was most concerned about. And apparently he saw something in Paul and Silas that he didn't have and that he desperately needed. 
And the question for us is, do people in our lives, especially those who don't know the Lord, the people in our lives that are far from him, do they see something in us? Do they see Jesus in us, just like the jailer saw in Paul and Silas? And here's the best part. When that happens, and people begin to encounter Jesus, that's when we get to answer important questions like, what must I do to be saved? Because Paul and Silas, they were ready for the question. Look at verse 31. Here's what they said. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night. Everybody remember what time it was? It's probably later now. Same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household, his family were baptized. I want you to notice the word immediately, the Bible says. He and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them, it says in verse 34, brought them into his house and set a meal before him. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. What an amazing story. And here's the process that we see in the jailer's life. And and I think this happens in all of our lives in in some way, right? I mean, you know, as you think about, you know, how we want to deep six our sins, right? Our secrets, our shame. And and we want want to come to Jesus and allow him to deep six those things in our life. Here's what happens, you know, and then we see this. I've seen this in my life. Pride is melted away. Doubts are minimized. And hearts begin to open up to whatever God wants. You know, pride, we think about pride. I mean, as we think about this process, pride usually is the first thing we come to. And pride is such a very deceitful thing that Satan likes to use in our life. Pride masquerades itself at times in our life as stubbornness. Pride masquerades itself at times as being intelligent. Pride masquerades itself at times by saying things like this. You know what? That's not necessary. You don't need that. You're above that. I know better. You know one of the worst things about pride? One of the worst things about pride is, usually you know who the last person to know that you have a pride issue? Yourself. That's what makes pride deadly, in fact. It keeps us away from God. It keeps us from following Jesus. It keeps us from seeing ourselves as we really are, and that is in need of a savior. And the second point of the process is dealing with our doubts, right? Once we get through our pride, it's dealing with our doubts because uh, sometimes our doubts get in the way of us actually giving it all over to Jesus and following him. And in fact, some of you may be here this morning and that could be you, your mantra in life is, you know what? Yeah, I get it. This all sounds really enticing. This idea of mercy and grace and and forgiveness. I I love all of it. I get that. But here's the deal, Will. I have doubts in my life. And until I get those doubts, fully resolved. I just don't think I can give myself fully to Jesus. And if that's you this morning, here's my message to you. Think about this. In what other area of life do we have to have all of our doubts eliminated to make some sort of decision? Think about that. In what other area of life, you know, you can think about anything. Do we have to have all of our doubts eliminated in order to make a decision? The answer is none. In fact, you know, the disciples that followed Jesus, truth is when he called them to be his disciples, they barely knew him. The Bible says they too had doubts. Even after they'd been following Jesus for a couple of years, they still had doubts. You know what's amazing to me? What's more amazing to me is Jesus didn't tell them, yeah, you should really get your stuff together before you come and follow me, right? You know, you should really deal 
with that sin, whatever it is, before you come and follow me. You should study your Bible more before you come and follow me. You should try to answer all the questions, you know, and, and if you need help, I'll try to answer all, your, all of your questions before you can follow me. Jesus didn't say any of that stuff. In, in fact, you know, what he tells him, he says, hey, listen, drop your nets, drop your tax collecting, drop whatever it is you're doing, and then follow me. Do you think the disciples still had doubts? Of course. Like I said, we even read in the Bible, they had doubts years even after following Jesus. You know what the, the, the truth is when it comes to that? That's where faith comes in. When we talk about faith as Christians, as a church, Paul told the jailer, he says, believe, right? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. If all of your doubts have to be eliminated, then really there is no need for faith, right? There isn't, you know, there isn't anything you do in life. Like I said, I mean, think about it. Get married, buy a house, you know, enter into a new friendship with somebody that, that you don't know that much, right? Whatever the case is, you know, there's nothing in life where you, you know, there's not gonna be some form of doubt. You need faith. And whenever we do that, here's the thing, here's the last part. That's when our hearts open up to God. And you know, when your heart opens up to God, the truth is anything is possible in your life. Anything. I've said it before and I'll say it again. One of the messages out of this sermon is don't wait to try to get yourself all cleaned up before you follow God, before you follow Jesus. Come to him and the promise is that he will go with you and clean you up along the way. That's the promise. Don't try to deep six all of your sin, all of your struggles, all of your shame. Give those things over to Jesus. He wants to deep six them for you. Don't try to bury them in a watery grave, you know, never to be remembered again, hoping that nobody ever finds out. The picture of baptism is simply this, and it's not something, you know, that, that you could put off. You know, baptism, this idea of, of dying to self, being raised to new life, that new life is offered to every single one of us. And it's not something you want to put off till tomorrow. The jailer, the Bible says he was baptized immediately. He and his whole family, sometime past midnight, he didn't wait. He didn't say, you know what, maybe I'm going to do that at some future date when I get everything lined up. In fact, the book of Acts, as you look at the whole book of Acts, you see all the conversion experiences when people, through faith and obedience, became a follower of Jesus. They were baptized immediately. And so we come to today, wrapping up this series, the sermon. Maybe you're here and God is impressed. The Holy Spirit has impressed on your heart. It's time to stop pushing down that beach ball, that sin, that shame, those secrets. It's time to give them over to me. It's time to, to, to stop wandering your own path, doing your own thing, allowing pride to get in the way. Instead, give it all over to me, follow me. Take my yoke upon you because my burden is easy and light. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't wanna wait to go to the beach and get baptized. You're here and you're like, hey man, there's a baptistry right there. Water's probably warmer. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to jump in. I'm ready to give it all. We're gonna have an invitation. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on up. And as they do that, I wanna pray with you. And if you're here and if you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus or any of the things we're talking about today, I invite you to come. I'd love to pray with you, talk to you about those things. 
Even after our service today and you're thinking, man, I just want to talk a little bit more. I'd love to get with you out in the gym and talk to you a little bit more. And, and maybe we can celebrate at the beach with you. Whatever it is, we, we, we just invite you to come today. Whatever God has laid on your heart. Let's pray together, okay? Father, I just thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, your grace. I thank you, Father, for meeting us here sometimes, God, when we're not ready to meet you. I thank you, God, that you're such a gentleman that you don't knock down the doors of our hearts. You just knock and wait. Wait for us to open up to you. I'm thankful, God, today as we talk about our pride getting in the way. God, I'm so thankful that you didn't give up on me when I felt like I was too proud, that I had it all figured out, and I didn't need you. I'm thankful, God, that you continually pursue us with your steadfast love. I know there's some maybe here today, God, or listening, and the message that they needed to hear today was through one of the scriptures that we read or this idea about trying to cover up our sin and our secrets and our shame. We don't need to do that because you want them, you, you ask for them, you long for them, you plead with us, in fact, to give them over to you and you'll take care of that. And you'll walk with us. You'll give us forgiveness. You'll give us your Holy Spirit. You'll grant forgiveness in our life, not, not just for past things or present, but as we walk with you for all future sins that we may create or make in our life, God, we have an opportunity to confess those things and repent. God, we're so thankful for salvation. And there may be some here that are just calling out to you right now, saying that they are in need of a savior. And so Father, may we rejoice in that. And may we celebrate today through faith, obedience, and baptism. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Um, we're gonna have an invitation song, like I said. And if you're here, and uh, you are ready to make that full commitment on and, and you, don't, you say, hey, I don't wanna wait till the beach. I wanna, I wanna do it now. We invite you to come, all right? Let's sing together.